Welcome to this episode of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Eric Shepard. Eric, would you like to introduce yourself to our watchers and listeners? Uh, yeah, I'm Eric Shepard. I'm calling in from Austin, Texas, uh, and I own the Shepard Agency, a voiceover talent agency uh, representing actors from all over the world. Well, great. Um, you're the first voiceover agency person I've ever met, and I think- oh, we're, a, we're a dime a dozen. <laughs> I always <laughs> tell people to- don't be the best, be the only. And I think you're close to the only. Um, so, uh, Eric, what kind of tools? Tell us about your first tool that you have to share with us. Uh, man, I'm a tool guy. I'm a, I like doodads and gigas. And um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I use for, uh, for audio. Uh, and then I recommend... Uh, for audio and then there's just stuff kind of you know that I use fortunately I'm unfortunately I'm at the the desk many hours a day so uh you know business type of stuff but I guess I'll start with some audio stuff yeah um it, that used to be uh you know it was a very specific type of person that was using this stuff this wasn't like you know everybody and their brother uh, had a microphone and nowadays you know folks have uh, some pretty nice stuff just to you know just to to do zoom calls with, with right. grandma. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, you know, I have, a, I have a Yeti mic that is, would have been a, the, the star of a studio 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, just how quickly the, the technology has gotten better. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And if, you know, a couple of years ago, folks in my industry, at least, you know, you had to remortgage your house to, to buy the gear that you needed. And now it's, uh, you know, anybody can just, uh, you know, buy an interface, buy a microphone and, yeah. uh, you know, stuff that used to be tens of thousands of dollars literally is, right. uh, you know, is a few hundred bucks. And then so much of that stuff that used to be hardware is now, you know, software. So you're in your recording software, even just free stuff that came with your Mac or whatever is, right. uh, you know, it was amazing. So what do you have to recommend us now? Uh, well, it doesn't really matter how great uh, your software is, or your microphone is a lot of folks, uh, and you'll notice this a lot on like podcasts and stuff like that, uh, have a problem with plosives. They're very poppy. Um, a plosive is, if you're talking, sometimes it's if you're too close to the microphone. Sometimes if it's, uh, your microphone is just a very sensitive microphone, uh, or, the way that you're addressing the microphone is a little too direct and your P's mostly will pop and they'll kind of distort and the air coming out of your mouth is going to hit that, the diaphragm of the microphone and you get this popping plosive type of sound uh, and it ruins the, the audio a lot of times. Sometimes you could go back in and post uh, and take it out. You'll see on the waveform, it's got a very specific type of of look to it, this weird glitchy kind of look. Uh, and sometimes you could just grab that and duck it down a little bit, but you can't get rid of it because then the P sound, you know, will be gone completely. So uh, the best thing to do is to, is to know how to use a microphone. Uh, you know, you don't want to, again, speak to this thing just directly dead on. You want to kind of speak across it a little right, bit. Just right. sometimes just this, just moving your head just slightly so that, that, you know, the air is kind of going across the microphone and out right into that, um, that diaphragm, that could be enough to do it. Um, but if you're having a conversation with somebody or, uh, you know, you're an actor, you're doing a, a video game or something and you're moving around and you're going crazy, you have whatever, you don't want to be thinking in your head the whole time. Oh, I have to be exactly, you know, on axis and I have to, uh, whatever. So that's why we use pop filters. Not everybody uses them. Uh, some folks in the voiceover industry are like, oh, I don't need a pop filter. I'm a great actor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I love these things, though. Um, you'll see some kind of the lower end uh, pop filters that are pretty ubiquitous. And they look kind of like um, uh, like stockings, like women's like pantyhose on a, on a hoop. Those things are, are bush league. They're terrible. Um, these things... And you're holding oh my it up. Favorite. You're holding it this. like a little tiny badminton racket that has a like a window screen ish screen on it. It does. It's metal. 
Um, this is the Stedman Pro Screen. So it's uh, the form factor is kind of similar. You know, you've got a gooseneck, you've got a clamp here uh, that a clamp on your microphone stand, and then you can kind of adjust this thing depending on what style uh, of microphone you have. Right. So it's about, um, it's about uh, two feet long, this little um, gooseneck, this little long flexible rod that um, at, at, the, at one end is the screen, which is about, I guess, six or seven inches in diameter and fairly flat. And then on the other end is a little clamp that you can, like a desk clamp to put on the edge of a desk. Well, so most of the time that'll go on your mic stand, uh, the clamp. But then, you know, some stuff, sometimes you have other stuff clamped to your mic stand uh, or it's you're raising and lowering it. Sure. So they give you enough room in the, the gooseneck there to kind of, you know, adjust this thing. Or you've right. got a mic that sticks out a lot so you can kind of, you know, bend and adjust right. the thing. Right. Uh, but the magic in these, in the the Stedman uh, Pro Screen, is that it is metal. So real if you had kind of a, you know, could, could zoom super far into here, you can't really see it so much with the naked eye. I can't see it with my old eyes. Um, but the the holes kind of point downwards. It kind of redirects uh, the air. So instead of just like a piece of uh, fabric, which diffuses things, or sometimes what we call them condoms, sometimes like those big giant foam things that, yeah. that you'll see sometimes on a microphone. Um, and those will work a little bit. They're not really meant to, to stop plosives, though. Um, but this does one thing. It's just to stop plosives. And I've had every pop filter in the universe. Uh, and for most mics, this thing does it, man. It just kills them. Right. You still have to know technique. You still have to be careful. I mean, mm. if you're, you know, right on top of this thing and you're really blasting away, um, especially on, you know, a very sensitive microphone, you're still going to have problems. But, right. uh, if you're in the market for a, for a pop filter mm. for most, uh, microphones, that's the one, man, right. for sure. So um, just because we're talking about microphones, and I'm curious, um, where uh, your microphone right now is not even visible to me. So so um, uh, um, you don't have it close to your mouth, right? Um, so how, how do you uh, arrange yours? Um, they are right. I don't even know what I'm using right now. <laughs> so, sort of, I got too many mic. I got a problem with my microphones. <laughs> if you, if you um, turn the camera around, there's like 50 microphones all pointing right at you. <laughs> we have a bunch of mics around here. Uh, but this is one that I just have set up for like, you know, YouTube kind of stuff, but it is a shotgun. Uh, okay. so I have it a little bit far away. It's maybe right. two feet away from, okay. uh, from okay. my mouth. So I don't have a pop filter or anything on that. Um, just because, you know, I'm not using it for, you know, super professional stuff. It's just to, you know, to kind of hop on Zoom. Sure. Okay. Um, so you have a shotgun. But it's a shotgun. Pointing with shotgun, which means it's pointing right at it. It kind of focuses on to a smaller area. Yeah. This this one here, this is a Sennheiser 416 shotgun microphone. This is super common kit uh, in the voiceover industry. You can get them. Uh, for like less than a grand, you get them for like 900 bucks. Sometimes they're super uh, reliable. They work on a variety of different voices. Um, so you see these in a lot of voiceover studios. It wasn't actually made for voiceover. This is one of those deals. Uh, normally you'll see it like on a big boom. Uh, you know, a guy's got a giant pole and then they'll have sometimes this big balloon thing over it and they'll be following, you know, actors down the street right. kind of thing. Uh, so it picks up audio from far away, but in a voiceover situation, when you're right here, uh, it's it's amazing. A lot of folks uh, use this microphone, uh, but and, you and see I want to describe it. Uh, it it's the, this microphone that you were just talking about, this shotgun. It's kind of like a long cylinder. It's like a piece of conduit pipe, about you know inch in diameter, and there's um it's just really long, I guess. And then at the other end, there's a little a little screen that's kind of um, arcing in front of it. But the idea is that it's a really long piece. Well, this deal, this is another uh, pop filter. Uh, if you're using, this doesn't come with it. If you were using this guy or some other one and you've got this thing on the stand and it's just awkward yeah. um, because it can, you know, come out quite a bit. Right. So we use this guy, which has become super popular. Um, it's made by, it's the hook makes this deal right. and this is metal as well. Uh, but this is more of a screen, very 
uh, you know, a light kind of screen and there's two layers. If you could uh -huh. see that. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of rubber band basically deals to hold it uh, that hold it on. So here's your regular 460. And again, this comes with like a big foam thing you could stick on it. Yeah. Uh, but that's a drag. And those foams, um, they come on with a lot of mics, a lot of road mics and right. stuff that right. mics that people have on their uh, DSLR cameras and those types of things. Right. That foam degrades over time. Um, so you could have it on there for a couple of years and not have any problems. And then one day you kind of go to, you know, to your desk or wherever you have it. Yeah. What the hell is on black? powdery and it, it, they, they just give up the ghost yeah um yeah but all that little stuff that little black powder stuff gets into the microphone especially in a shotgun microphone you know like this you can see there's openings and that'll you know that's it it'll destroy your mic right um so i don't recommend using the phone and again it's not really meant for pops but something like this is it's a pop filter it's meant for so you can tell the air you know it's coming from your face is getting broken up by these two layers and then there's a little more air there like it wouldn't work as well if it was you know dead on uh -huh. um but this little guy works great man and you don't have to worry about clamping something else and a big you know the, the gooseneck right. and all that kind of stuff and so for going back uh, going back to the circular one that you were recommending for a general microphone what's that called again that's the stedman pro screen Stedman Pro Screen. Okay. You could get those for like 80 bucks ish. Sure. I've gotten them for. I've got, <laughs> I've got too many of them. Uh, but I think that's usually what we want okay. to pay. But it's less than $100 for sure. Okay, great. The Stedman um, Pro Screen. So, um, Eric, what's uh, what's your number two um, tool? Uh, man, I don't even remember what I put on my list. Oh, I do. <laughs> so, here. This thing, everyone's going to think I'm a goof, man, but I, I'm telling you, I love this thing. And I've loved this thing for like a decade. Uh, and then I just wound up seeing it in the store, which is like, I bought these for like family and friends and stuff. Every On Christmas, I used to do this like Oprah thing where I get, <laughs> get everybody like my favorite things. And I always give everybody one of these too. And they'd be like, what is this dumb thing? I'm like, no, nah, it's great. It's, this is, it's called a page up and it's just a, it's just a paper holder okay. for your desk all right so you're uh, holding up you're holding up in your hand a little tiny thing that could fit inside your fist it has a kind of a half of an egg shape it's kind of oval like an egg but it's like half of it and then there's this sliced opening at a oblique angle through the top half of the egg the plastic egg yeah and it's it's got a little sand in there or something to weigh it down um okay but we were promised a paperless society, uh, but that is yes to occur. I have ludicrous amounts of papers that come across my desk. Uh, so sometimes you know you've got something here, and I looked around. I'm gonna like I don't buy gum unless I look at a bunch of reviews. You know, yeah. I'm always every day I check cool cool tools and uh, wire cutter. I'm a big wire cutter guy. Yeah. I love those guys. Yeah. Uh, and you know I'm always checking stuff. And it was like, you know, you can't really look like paper holder upper thing, you know, whatever. Uh, and so but we, uh, oftentimes they would sell, you go to like the, you know, the office store, whatever. And it was these big monsters, you know, these big plastic things or the thing yeah, that you yeah, could yeah. clamp over it and hook it and whatever. And I, it just didn't, you know, I didn't want this thing cluttering up my, uh, my desk space. And, you know, most of the time. Uh, especially now, if you've got, you know, multiple monitors, I got this big wide screen and another one and whatever and the iPad. And, um, you know, it's not like you're using paper constantly, but when you are and you need to have it, you know, held up because you're typing or whatever, um, this thing is great, man. And I'm telling I use it a couple of times a day. Sometimes I'm processing uh, checks. So a lot of checks come in and I'll put those in and it holds, you know, standard sizes of paper real easily. Uh, I mean, you could put you know, 20 it, sheets it, in there, but two or three. But this is a way for holding up a piece of paper vertically. That's the that's what a tool does. It's, 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 it's like if you wanted to read paper rather than having it flat on your desk, it holds it up that's parallel to you. So it stands up, stands a piece of paper up, basically. Is that what it's doing? Exactly. Right. Exactly. You just stick it in the bottom and it folds it just enough to it doesn't wreck it, but then, you know, it stands up on its own. Right, right. And it's just when you're not using it, it just disappears. You know, it's unobtrusive. They make all kinds of cutesy ones, though, with little sparkles and stuff. So if you don't necessarily want it to disappear, right, right. Uh, you know, you want to uh, have one with a little more pizzazz. I go for the basic black myself. Right. Um, but man, I'm tapped for 
some time I've been using this. And then I saw that, where the heck was that? Uh, the container store. You ever go to the container store? I mean, that place is great. If you're into like tools and stuff, they got all kinds of cool stuff there. And everything is like 80,000 times the price that it should be. <laughs> so you like see stuff and you're like, oh no, I like this. That's terrible. And you walk out like $5,000 later with like some bins, you know? Right, right. Uh, but that place is great. But I have, they have, you know, all these shelves and setups where there's all, uh, you know, little things like this. And I had caught it and I was like, oh, look at this. I am a man. I, it was me. I was first. I've been telling people about these things for like a decade and I never saw them anywhere. And I just, this was just two so weeks what, ago. Maybe so, I saw them uh, is there, Do you have an Amazon link? Where are they called now? Page up. They call them page. Up. Um, okay. They're like five bucks, six bucks, you know, page up. Okay. So it's, again, it's for holding paper and pages up. I guess it would work if you were, Doing a recipe, you want to look at it on paper or um, you're reading from it while you're narrating your story or um, you're typing for something. Yeah. So that could see, as you said, we have not left paper yet, although many people are trying to. We still got paper in our lives. We're still, you know, unfortunately, we stay, it's almost every day. It seems like we got to print something and then I got the shredder and you shred. And then you think like, can I recycle the shreddings? I don't even know. And they have to go in a bag. And, ugh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, say one day, okay. one day we'll get there. So, so Eric, what's your number three tool? Uh, what else did I want to talk about? So this thing I got fairly uh, recently. So I'm a big light guy i like lights i dig lights i'm sensitive to to lighting um and i like to keep my office uh fairly dark usually i have blue lights just on in the office um and i dig it sometimes i'll wake up like <laughs> i'm not right man like three or four in the morning and they'll be like oh it's something will hit me and i gotta go to work so i go into the office and it's just big bright you know lights uh they just make me nuts uh, especially again, you know, I got a lot of monitors and stuff and I just, you know, I, I don't like having a ton of lights around, but, um, not having them on, uh, tends to be a problem on a cape just occasionally. So I have some task lighting. Uh, I have, my desk is Jesus. This one is eight or nine feet across. Um, and I've got some lights on the end if I'm doing stuff, but if I'm doing something, uh, at kind of my main section here, workstation, where I got my little page up thing or whatever, and I have to see what the hell I'm doing. Uh, it didn't really work to have like task lighting. So I was trying to figure out, you know, how, how is this going to work? And I came up with this, uh, or didn't come up with, but discovered this BenQ light bar. Um, the one that I have, I can't show you the one section there because I'm looking at it, uh, is called the screen bar halo. And essentially what it looks like, it looks like that microphone we were showing before. It's just a long tube uh, and it's got a strip of LED lights on the bottom uh, and it sits on top of your monitor. So it sits up there, uh, not unlike a, a webcam, you know, it's got a little, you kind of adjust the back of the thing and it, you know, it just, uh, it sits there. So you stick it in the middle of your monitor. They've got a couple different versions uh, my main monitor is a curved widescreen uh -huh. type deal. So the standard one wouldn't work because, uh, you know, it would wind up banging into the thing. So they have one, this one, the screen bar halo is more recommended for the, the curved monitors. And I think essentially the main difference is just that it comes out farther. Okay. Um, you know, so instead of being kind of right there on the curve, it gives you like another inch or two. So the monitor is curved around it. Right. Uh, and then that that bar is there, and that's one part. And then on your desk, you got this little hockey puck jobber. Um, so it's uh, you know I don't know two three inches across, right. a little glossy front, and it's just this little weighted puck. Uh, disc yeah. that you have, and it connects wirelessly to the light. Um, so I guess they have this set up so that it, it saves battery life. Because if it was constantly talking to each other, which is, you know, the battery and the little puck would die. Obviously, the light itself is, you know, is plugged in. Um, so the way that they solve that is you have to hover your hand over 
the this little puck. Uh, so you put your hand, you know, an inch or so over the puck, and then it lights up. So it knows that you're there, and then you can turn it on. Um, it'll turn orange for like a second, and then you're able to turn it on. And then around this puck is a, and this is a real, uh, it's got some weight to it, and it's really made, uh, it's pretty impressive uh, how well it's made. The outside is a, uh, is a dial, so it's a dimmer. And you're able to choose uh, how bright it is, and you can dim, or, and then it's, it's like a touch screen. I mean, it's not you know, quite like a, a cell phone, but it's touch capacitive or whatever you would call it. Uh, and you could adjust the, the temperature the same way. So if you touch the temperature button, I doubt you could see it uh, on there. Oh, you can a little bit. Yeah. You can say I could go from warm uh, to white. Yeah. And then it's got another light on the back, actually. So you could change that function right. uh, as well. But all of this stuff, uh, you can do with this with this little puck, and you can adjust the light itself. But mostly, it's meant just to point downwards uh, to you know to light up just the area in front of uh, your monitor where you're where you're at. So uh, you know if you're working at night and you just want to see you know maybe your keyboard, your keyboard doesn't uh, you know isn't backlit, mine isn't backlit, <clears throat> and you don't want to turn all the lights on. Uh, or you want to, again, you know, like me, mostly I like to keep the lights kind of dim, but sometimes I have to see something. Uh, I'll put that on and it's just, you know, it's not shining in my face. Right, it's right. not lighting up the whole world. It's just lighting up you know, the area, to basically just the area, you know, exactly that I need sure. uh, yeah. the exact brightness and the exact temperature. And uh, for me, that wow, that's yeah. perfect. So it's know? like a spotlight, but it's a little diffuse spotlight and spotlighting right over your workspace on your desktop. So instead of yeah, well, because the bar is like you know this right. wide, right. it's you know it gives you a nice uh, you know a nice swap. But again, you're able to you know just kind of keep it where you want to. It's pointing down. Like I have, I have a big monitor which is up fairly high, you know, high enough to have another full size monitor underneath it. So this thing is a couple feet up in the air. Uh, and it's still, you know, I don't keep it as bright as it, uh, as it can be. I just, you know, I don't need to, and it still lights up, you know, the whole area. Okay. And, and, um, that's called again, what was the name of it? The, again, there's a few different versions that are made by BenQ. I believe it's how you pronounce uh -huh. it. B-E-N-Q. Uh, this one that I have is the screen bar halo. Okay. Uh, again, because I think this version worked best with the, the big curve monitors, but I know they have cheaper versions. Screen, well, screen bar, still. screen bar seems to be the, um, maybe the, the, uh, model number or the name of the thing, screen bars, so yeah. different versions. And it's something that mounts on your screen, on your monitor, looking down. Um, that's very clever. That's very clever. Yeah. I have my own jury rig one, which is an led, but it's not a strip. I like the idea of a strip. That's pretty cool. I have a little spot LED over here, and um, I think it would be better to have a strip. You almost serve like if you had pointed up, it almost serve like a ring light, kind of. But it's a bar light, I guess, for your zooming time. Does, They're pretty slick looking. Does it, too, does it know, light your face? Does it light your face when you have it on? No, not really. Uh, I mean, you can you can kind of twist it. Yeah. Um, but then, like, if you were zooming at night. And head it on, it wouldn't. It be wouldn't that. be. It, that would definitely wouldn't be the best. Okay. Uh, for that, it's more you know to to point down. Sure. Okay. Alrighty. Well, that's really great. Um. So your fourth tool, Eric. Uh Oh, lighting. I was talking about lighting. So it struck me. Uh, again, I like. I'm a big light guy. And I'm in the uh, the Philips Hue uh, world. Right. environment whatever you would call Phillips, it Phillips uses a kind of a a, a we, we programmable lights maybe we'll call it light bulbs yeah light bulbs. smart lights smart whatever lights. yes uh we're like a billion dollars in the hue lights around here <laughs> <laughs> I love these things and it started with uh my son when he was a few years younger he would go uh he had all his toys and stuff his outdoor stuff in the garage you know, sports equipment and Nerf guns and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he would go out to play and he would never turn the light off. Ever. He just never turned it off. 
So he would, you know, come in and eat dinner or whatever. And then I would go out to the garage sometimes, you know, even the next day and all the lights are on. And then I'm a dad that breaks all dad laws. Like you have to go nuts, you know, to so make like, you didn't turn on the God dang it. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I go nuts. And if, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. And then that's, you know, later that same evening, God, blah, the lights are on again or whatever, you know, and it was like this constant argument. And I was like, oh, okay, so either I'm going to kill this kid or um, what am I going to do here? So I, the solution in, in that situation, because this was a few years ago, was pretty low tech. He said, wait a second, I can replace the light switch in the garage with one of those motion sensors. Right. Um, you know, they sell it like Home Depot for like 20 bucks. Uh, and you can get better ones where you could adjust the amount of time right. where, where they turn off. Uh, but in that situation, all of the lights in the garage were just, you know, at the one switch and you could see... Uh, you know, the switch, you know, was in view uh, and it was perfect. So I replaced it and it was like, this is awesome, man. It was so good. Like we never had that argument again. You never had to worry about turning them off. Um, and then we got kind of used to the light, you know, turning on and off by itself uh, was was cool. And then once we got into the smart lights and put them around uh, and there are a lot of, like they're entirely un in that unnecessary uh, <laughs> that's perhaps, uh, you know, you have some sort of, uh, disability or something like that. I, 99% of people don't need these things. Uh, but they're, but they're cool, you know, like they're fun to play with. I love playing with them, especially, you know, the different colors and I get all kinds of stuff happening. It's different apps you could play with. And, um, you know, we've got pretty much all the lights in the house are now these Philip Hue lights. Um, and actually, I don't know how the, like, so one of the things that, that readers may, uh, watchers may want to know is that these days in our basement and garage and stuff, we have those motion sensor lights, but they're built into the light bulb itself. Yeah. Right. So, so that you don't need to replace the switch. Each light bulb itself is doing that little motion sensing and it looks like a regular light bulb and they're just, they're, you know, they're, they're Chinese brandless thing. They're just, you know, hundreds of different makers of them and you just screw in the light bulb and it's now a motion sensing light bulb for that area. But tell me about the Philips Hughes. How do they work? Are they, are they, are they networked? Um, do they talk to each other? Um, how, how does that work? The, there's a bunch of different ones now. Uh, Philips even makes a different uh, range or brand. The Hue is still like their, uh, you know, flagship brand, but GE make everybody get like got into the game. And some of them are Zigbee and some of them are Wi-Fi and whatever. Uh, the Hue ones, you need a bridge. Uh, so there's a little, you know, square puck kind of thing. And you plug that into your router and then they all talk to the bridge. And then you can connect, you know, you control them on your phone or your iPad or through, uh, you know, voice assistance or uh Apple home Alexa, and stuff, so you know, whatever. Alexa, no. like Alexa will will um will be able to control your lights in your house. Yeah, yeah. You can say, so, and then you set up different zones and rooms and stuff. The setup can get a little bit crazy sometimes, uh, but it's gotten better. Um, so you know, you tell Alexa to you know turn off the kitchen lights or turn off the you know this that or whatever. Uh, but the the piece of kit that I wanted to nominate as a, as a cool tool. You can see one actually right back right there are the, the motion sensors. Um, you know, a lot of people have smart lights and I think a lot of them don't utilize the motion sensors uh, that often. And that is the, that's the best part. Yeah. So we have one uh, in the kitchen. So we haven't turned on and off or off the kitchen light in years. So, you know, we're just very used to, you walk in the kitchen, we usually come in the house through the garage, um, you know, park the car, and then we walk into the kitchen. We're always in the kitchen. Every time you walk in, the lights go on. And when you walk out, you don't have to worry about shutting them off. The lights go off. Uh, again, you know, if you have kids, it's awesome. Right. Um, and it's just, you know, it's something technology uh, oftentimes is the best when you don't think about it. It's not something that you have to think about or, or worry about it. You know, it just works. Um, and for the most part, this technology just works. So, uh, you know, you walk in, the lights go on, you walk out and the lights go off and you think, well, that's not so, you know, life changing. Uh, but how cool is that, man? It's great. You know, we have them set up uh, on the stairs. So at night you're walking up the stairs, we have guests, uh, you know, over and you, you just walk up the stairs and the lights go on. Um, we go to bed usually fairly uh, early around here. So we have them set 
like we'd be watching TV at night or something. And you go to get a drink and the, you know, like the lights are blind. You see, we have them set at like nine o'clock. They only go on halfway. They go on dim. So you can go in the kitchen and, you know, grab whatever you want. Um, same thing with the stairs. Right. Then the upstairs, the upstairs, like we live in Texas. The houses are like massive. They're ridiculous. Um, it was kind of too, like there's like an open room at the top of the stairs and then it went down a hallway. So that was a little awkward, but we were able to get two and they're cheap. They're like 30 something bucks um, and mount both of them. And then in the software and the, you know, in the app link the two uh, motion sensors. So if one goes off or the other goes off, you know, we turn those, those lights on. Right, right. So as long as you're moving, you know, in the room, uh, it's just seamless. You know, you, you just don't think about it. You just walk in and the lights go on right, right, and, yeah. and you walk out and they turn off. And uh, that's, that's the way life should be. I mean, really, you know, it's just cool. And again, there's a lot of different ways to solve, um, you know, the issue. There's uh, like I was saying before, you know, sometimes you just get a cheap uh, little motion sensor. Sometimes that doesn't work. Light. I was talking about the boy before. His little sister now has gotten older and she's got the same problem, man. As I blame my wife's jeans. <laughs> so she doesn't turn off the light, but she's always in the closet. She goes in the closet <laughs> and she gets her shoes or jacket or whatever and would never shut that light off. But the switch for the closet is on the outside. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't put one, you know, a, a yeah. motion switch on that because then every, it would just always be on. Right. You know, every time you walk past the closet, the light would turn on. So I did what, what you were saying. I got a, you know, it was, 15 bucks or whatever. Yeah. It was like an LED light that had its own built-in right. motion sense right. in the closet. So right. when you walk in, you know, you go in. The bathroom, here's the, the Philip Hughes, they're pricey, man. Especially if you want to go with the color ones, they're mm -hmm. pricey. So some place, some rooms, we just have white. We have, you know, different temperatures right. of white, but not because it's like, you know, 50 light bulbs right. in there, but I would go broke, you know, if they were all color. Oh. Um, but like the, the, the little powder room downstairs, uh, you know, half bath, whatever. Same deal. The kids go in, they never shut off. The, you know, when she was little, especially, she wouldn't shut off the light. So instead of, but the light fixture there has like multiple right, lights right, in right. it. And I was like, this is going to cost me a few more bucks and hue lights and a motion sensor and whatever. Forget it. So I just put one, you know, changed out the switch there. So you walk into the bathroom and the lights turn on and you, you know, the kids could leave the bathroom. You don't have to worry about shutting the light off which is handy, but you can't have that in a regular bathroom uh, where you'd be taking a shower because you get in the shower and close the curtain and start, la and then, it, you know, the, the sensor won't see the motion and now you're going to be in the dark. Um, so, you know, different rooms sure. uh, yeah. require different, uh, you know, different ways right, of right, doing right, things. Right. But if you're, you're in any way on the smart lights, uh, the motion sensors are awesome, man. Sure. We have them outside as well. So if you walk up onto the, you know, the front porch, yeah. somebody's, uh, you know, comes to deliver or whatever, those lights go on. The ones in the back when we pull up in the car or anybody's walking, you know, somebody yeah. shouldn't be there or whatever, instead of having like big, uh, you know, security lights or whatever, it's just the regular lights right, go on. Right. So to anybody else, it looks like, you know, perhaps somebody flip the lights on. Right. Um, That's and it's, you know, as many yeah. lights as you want. You could have it set when you go away. If somebody walks up to the front door, the lights go on in the, in the bedroom or the living room, or, you know, wherever the heck you want. Right. Um, it's really kind of a, you know, kind of a cool thing. Yeah. But I think when, once you add uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of different accessories for these things, probably the dumbest of all the accessories are the switches. So you put all these like, uh, you know, smart lights in your house, but then you can't use the switch anymore because if you shut the switch off, you know, that's it. They don't connect anymore. So we got these little plastic covers to cover like 800 light switch, you know, <laughs> things. So you can't use them. And then you buy a switch. You know, like my wife's like, Real, this is your hobby. I'm like, shut up. It's cool. So then you buy, <laughs> you're going to put a new like smart switch, you know, next to your regular right, right. switch. It's got a cover over it. And that's dumb. Uh, but at least you take the switch, you know, and bring it with you and whatever. So there's, there's, you know, ways around that. Or you just talk or again, uh, you know, you have these motion things. Yeah. Uh, so a combination of all that stuff, you know, was great. Like before I was saying, you know, we like to watch movies in the living room. Uh, we wouldn't want a motion sensor in there because, you know, it's going to ruin your TV show. So we'll tell Alexa when we go in the living room, you know, if we want the lights on or off or dim or whatever, or we've got a little dimmer in there that we could use as well so it's you know it's different solutions for different rooms yeah. but 
um, you know, if you're into the smart lights anyway, just to light them, you know, have different colors and to play games and stuff, um, the motion detectors really make it, uh, you know, seamless. And, well, it, that's fabulous. So yeah. thank you, Eric, for that. That's really great. We got the message. Philips Hughes are a place to start if you're concerned about quality, but I, I know that there are lots of other alternative systems as well. Um, but smart lights, and the smarter they get, the less you have to engage with them, which is really where you want to go. So thank you for that. So Eric, what's do you have um, do you have something you want to um, share with our audience? Something um, your a project you're working on, a passion you're excited by? What's this is your moment to to share with us? I've got no, I've got nothing to plug. I work uh, like I said in, in the voiceover industry. Um, my wife's in the voiceover industry. We got the kids in voiceover, and that's all we do. That's all we do from uh, from morning. It, I'm a one trick pony, man. I got no other skill set. Well, let's talk Here about let's talk about voiceover then. Okay, so you know a lot about this. Um, do you have any bits of advice of, of either if someone needs a voiceover, what they should do, or if they want to become involved in it? So, for the average person, um, what would you say? What should they know about this? If you need voiceover, obviously you go to shepherd.agency and then you can get the best. There's my plug. Then you can get the best voiceover talent uh, in the world. If you're thinking of getting into voiceover, uh, be careful. There's a lot of uh, folks out there who make a living off of people who want to get in the voiceover industry. A lot of people want to get in the voiceover industry uh, because they think it's cool and it's fun and they have a nice voice and they whatever. Um, but it's very difficult. It's a, a terrible, terrible get rich quick scheme. Okay. Uh, and it's become kind of this new cool thing. People think, oh, I could do that and I'm creative and I, you know, I have lips, I can talk. Um, <laughs> but you know, I have a scalpel that doesn't mean that I'm a surgeon. Uh, so, it, you know, it takes quite a long time to learn how to act right, and that's right. what it is, you know, is, is acting. So if you're looking to get into something, you know, for fun, uh, you know, maybe check out voiceover if sure. you're looking to have a career and you think, Hey, I, you know, this will be something I could, right. And I can you- cram for, for a little while and it'll become a new career. Uh-huh. Uh, definitely, you know, look elsewhere, start a look at another pyramid scheme or something, because <laughs> this takes quite a long time before you get to a, a, a point where, uh, and are, are you, know, are you, use your circle of professionals, are they at all worried about the AIs um, who are doing speech synthesis from text and stuff like that? Is that sort of like are those two different worlds? Is it most of the people who are going to use something like that or just never would have never ever considered a voiceover? Or um, or is this getting to the point where it actually they're concerned about their their livelihood? Uh, a lot of folks are concerned, you know, there are some talent. Uh, and they make their living, you know, four or five hundred dollars at a time. They'll do a lot of uh, what we call like explainer videos or corporate mm-hmm. uh, videos, that kind of stuff. Uh, and some of that stuff may go, you know, AI. Some of the AI is is becoming good. A lot of these programs were trained by voiceover actors. Voiceover right. actors were, you know, were hired and uh, in a lot of cases, you know, paid fairly handsomely to, you know, read all kind of lips and more and blah, blah, you know, kind of stuff, um, to train these things. Okay. So in some instances, uh, yeah, you know, folks are a little worried, but you know, can they act, mm, you know, on their own without people, uh, you know, telling them exactly where the, you know, where the inflection should be to be believable. Not, not quite yet. Uh, you know, it's still kind of uncanny Valley. Um, you know, it's something where this is a character where you really believe in, you know, something in a, uh, you know, in a video game or a motion picture or something. Uh, I don't think we're too worried about AI yet, mm-hmm. but you know, everybody's talking about it now. And I think it's being shoehorned into uh industries where it should like search it shouldn't be in search right now because it's wrong so <laughs> it's wrong very often uh you know i don't want my top search result to be something that it made up mm-hmm. um but you know everybody's jumping on the bandwagon but i think it's going to change a lot of industries for sure uh and it's definitely something we're, we're keeping a very close eye on mostly 
uh, the concern among professional talent and among uh, SAG, our union, is that contract state specifically, and this has all been happening in the past you know, month or so, uh, that our voices cannot be used for AI because a client me, sometimes me, will me. hire the voice talent. And then afterwards, they also sell that audio to some AI company for their training. And then all of a sudden, you've got some AI uh, you know, computer and you go, Dang, that sounds a lot like me. How is that? Oh, wait, that guy took it and sold it and whatever. So now it's, um, you know, that's what uh, what voiceover talent are, are right. doing. So you're, you're trying to, to prevent themselves. people saying, um, say this in the style of Eric Shepard. You don't, the, the, yeah. The, the, yeah, well, I mean, you know, it would be uh, when you, your voice is used to, or your performance is right. used to train these things. Right. Um, you know, Basically, once they tear all that apart and they figure out your specific, you know, your cadence and where you like to go up and where you go down and where you sound a little higher and where you sound a little lower and um, your specific timbre, you know, all the different things that make up your your voice and your performance. And, uh, you know, again, can you completely replicate that? Can you now read a script and it's going to sound like how I would would read the script? Not entirely, but, uh, man, you know, it's, it's getting close enough that uh, it's a little... It's, it's kind of warm in here. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, well, well enough. Um, Eric, thank you for um, uh, sharing with us your tool selection, which was really um, unorthodox and wonderfully diverse, which is the reason why we do this. I always loved hearing about things that um, I didn't know about. So thank you. Um, and for sharing your knowledge about the, the biz and the voiceover and audio. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. So um hope you have a great day in the rest of Absolutely. Time. This was a pleasure. Long, long time fan. Well, first, first time guest, but long time fan. I love cool tools. That's so thank how you we guys. like it. So thank you. <laughs> this year, our cool tools blog will be 20 years old, which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going, and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year, and I'm inviting our guests and listeners to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast and have four uncommon tools that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website and we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking on, talking on a video and um, you need to have some tools that you can show um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom. We do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools, and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way, um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the U.S., although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a longtime listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy, from something in the kitchen to something used to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you.